Welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to have everybody here for our midweek program. I'm Mark Wethington, director of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, and we have got one of my favorite topics today, and that is vines. I love, love, love growing with vines, and I love these vines. I am I've always been a big fan of vines, and I find that they are, for some reason, well, I won't say for some reason, that they are underutilized in the landscape. People feel like they have to have a, uh, you know, a special structure for them, an arbor, a pergola. Often people are afraid of vines because they want a vine that grows very quickly, um, but then they want it to stop, and it kind of doesn't work like that either. You get you know, more restrained vines where you have quicker growing vines, but they really don't take much more work than any other plant you might have in the garden. And they certainly add to the beauty of, of, of places. Here at the, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, when we built our new building, it was stark. <laughs> I remember pulling into the parking lot for a visit not long after the Arboretum had opened the new building, the Ruby McSwain Center in 2002, and it looked like a concrete bunker. And I just thought, oh my gosh, what have they done? But, you know, some plantings around it and some vines on it, and all of a sudden it became a much, much more welcoming, much more living, breathing kind of, of space. We have got this, somehow have gotten this impression in the U.S. that you can't, that growing vines on buildings is, is dangerous somehow, that it's going to ruin the, the buildings. Going back to this picture, that house is probably older than the United States, and they've been growing vines on it for ages and ages, and it's just fine. It does depend a little bit on your material, but vines don't tear apart your mortar and things like that. It's a lot of that is kind of an old wives tale. And all over this building where, you know, even if you don't have vines that will cling to your building like this one, and we'll talk about that, one, but, you know, you, if you look carefully in there, you can kind of see a grid shadow and that's, that's all some new vine supports that we have just recently put in last year. And so we will have this vine that grows up and covers this entire side. We just love having vines everywhere we can. And I certainly do at home. And, and, you know, they, they do love them in the UK, much more so than here. But, you know, isn't this great? This wall, there's plantings on the top. So they have roses cascading from the top. And then they have a treckless spermum coming up from the bottom. So they have these two different textures on this wall. I, I love that. I love that so much. Using kind of creeping woody plants and, and weeping woody plants to, to cascade down and then meet up with vines. But, you know, these are all on, on walls. I love vines. I grow, you know, smaller, more restrained vines through the plants in my garden. Once a shrub or a tree has gotten large enough that I think it can, it isn't going to be smothered by a vine. I plant one, two, sometimes three different vines around its base. And, and I'll talk about some of those vines that I, I've done that with as we go on. Uh, you know, and the other beauty with vines is even if you do have put a special structure up for them, you know, you can really create some beautiful, fun things, whether it's, you know, a permanent arbor or these were some temporary vine supports made out of bamboo that one of our NC State University professors, his class created. And then these are just annual vines. So these were created during the spring semester and then you know, the vines by, by, you know, really by early summer had grown quite a bit on there. And by the end of summer, these things were completely covered. So, you know, when you're talking about annual vines, they can, they can really quickly cover a, a structure. I, I don't, I did not include annual vines in my, my talk, mostly because I don't grow very many of them, but certainly most of what I say, you could, apply to to annual vines like moon vine and coral bean and things like that. So I'll start with a few of our eastern North American natives. One of the more vigorous ones is bignonia, bignonia crepulata, known as trumpet creeper. 
this orangey one, the one that's on our, our arbor out front and uh, this close-up picture, this is one called Jekyll. I, I, for years, I called it Jekyll, thinking it was after Gertrude Jekyll, but it's actually named for Jekyll Island, which is uh, down off the coast of Georgia. And there's a darker form, Atrosanguinea. There, there are a few different forms of this, but even just the species is great, but it is vigorous. So um, you either need to have a really sturdy, large structure for it, or you need to plan on doing some, some pruning on it. But it flowers for a long period. The hummingbirds love it. And here you can see this is an arbor we have at the Arboretum. And it was just these wooden posts going out and then down to some, some uprights. And it wasn't really great for vines because it was just these, these individual things. So we, we put in some copper pipes through there, our volunteer crew did. So now we have a, a better space for vines. There's more for them to cling on to and to hold them up. But we do love letting the trumpet keeper, especially when it's flowering, kind of come down a little bit. And, you know, I'm okay if, if plants touch people and if people touch plants, I think that's a good thing. And when it's in flower, you love walking through those flowers. And then after it finishes, we prune it back up. So it's, uh, you know, the leaves and stems aren't hanging in people's way. Another great native is our Carolina jessamine. Jocimium sempervirens. Uh, this bright yellow form is, that's the wild form. And that's flowering out in the woods already right now. It's starting to flower. I've, I've seen it here and there in the woods. There's actually two species that we have. There's Jocimium sempervirens, which is a vigorous, great evergreen vine with these beautiful gold flowers. Lovely fragrance. I really Love that smell. It's it's the smell of spring to me. And then there's another species that's not as vigorous, not quite as floriferous, called Gelsemium rankinii. And that one flowers later. So I often like to plant them together, and you'll get kind of this succession of blooms as, as the next, as the other species flowers. There are some other ones, there's some double flowered forms of it, which are really nice up close from a distance. They look about the same as this. This Woodlander's Pale Yellow from Woodlander's Nursery in Aiken, South Carolina, I really like as well. Some people, this is, this is a bit much for them in that bright color, but this pale yellow one they found is gorgeous. I look in the woods, I look while I'm driving. I, I'm always looking for variations this time of year of this gold. I've never seen anything like this pale yellow out in the wild and really, really enjoy that, that plant. Another native, and this is one of these plants that can be described as a vine or could be sometimes described as a scandent shrub, which just means it's a shrub. It can be a shrub if you plant it in the ground, but it'll have kind of long straggly branches. A lot of these plants in the wild, like this climbing aster, this used to be known as Aster carolinianus. Now it's Ampelaster carolinianus. Who knows, maybe it'll go back to aster again one of these days. Uh, they seem to move it back and forth. This one, we've we've had this planted just in a in a spot with nothing to climb on. And it just makes kind of this haystack to about three feet tall and four or five feet wide. In the wild, it'll do that, but often it's it's growing kind of at the edge of woodlands. And so it'll put up a shoot. And if there's a low branch, a shrub or a tree, it'll snake up through that and keep going up as long as it has something to give it a little bit of support. So this is it on a fence. Uh, this is at the Paul J. Senior Botanic Garden in Kernersville, North Carolina, outside Winston-Salem. And you can see, you know, if this isn't this is an aster. This is a, you know, basically a, a, a fall aster. It starts flowering late summer, early fall. Butterflies love it with these nice soft lavender flowers. Really just an interesting plant. I kind of like it a little bit more on woodland edges and things. This is a plant that if I have a, a stump kind of in a sunny spot, but coming into a more natural woodland area, the first thing I think of is, oh, I should plant an ampelaster there um, and let it climb up on that stump and cascade over and not so much to cover the stump, but to, to give it something to climb up. I just think it's kind of a magical uh, way to use that plant. I will say it is perhaps not the most 
spectacular plant when not in flower, but it is a, a good, easy plant. The Dulcimian, this is a good evergreen. Sempervirens, always green. The Bignonia is mostly evergreen for us in the southeastern U.S., although it can go more deciduous as it goes farther north. These first two are pretty early blooming plants. This Ampelaster is a fall blooming plant. And where people struggle a lot is how, how and when to prune their vines. And Homeowners make it more confusing. Professionals often make it more confusing than it needs to be. It does not need to be complex. If your plant flowers early in the spring, you know, early to say, you know, mid spring, early summer, you want to prune it if it needs to be pruned after it flowers. You want to do it with within, oh, uh, you know, 30 day, a month, month and a half of it finishing flowering. That's ideal. If it flowers later in the fall, you can prune it over the winter, early spring, uh, that type of thing. So if you wanted to prune this plant, if it was just getting too big out here and you wanted to thin it out a bit and, and, and reduce it, you could do that over the winter. While the gelsemium, which flowers very early, is flowering now, you'd want to prune it right after it finishes flowering. That's because if it flowers early, it has set those buds in the fall before it goes dormant for the winter. So if you prune it in late summer, or fall or winter, you're going to prune off the flower buds. It's flowering on that old growth. The same way with this, if you flower, if you prune this one over the summer and you prune too late, you're going to, it's going to put that growth into the foliage and, you know, more that type of growth, the vegetative growth, and not into flower. So just watch when you're, when your plants flower, and then that tells you when to prune them. Same is true of flowering shrubs. You know, if they flower in the spring, prune them after they flower. If they flower late summer or fall, you can prune them winter or spring. You know, wisterias have, have gotten a bad name. Rightly, they are weedy. The, the Asian wisteria, wisteria floribunda and wisteria sinensis to a lesser extent, you know, they have escaped their bounds. They are wild through our woodlands. I would make the argument that if you go to where there are there is wisteria in the woods, they're not really displacing a lot of native plants. They can be troublesome at times, but probably look worse than they really are. And they do need sunlight. They're not growing in really, you know, woodland, deep woodland areas. But we do have native wisterias. Uh, Wisteria frutescens is the one you see more often. Instead of the really long racemes of flowers, they're more, think of a, you know, they're kind of almost fist-like or pine cone-like. So they don't dangle down quite so long as the Asian ones. And as you can see here, they flower with the foliage. The foliage has come out while they're flowering, while the, the other wisteria is really stark before the, the leaves come out. So the Asian wisterias are, quite frankly, more showier plants. But if you want that look without worrying about it becoming a real pest and being overly vigorous as well, the longwood purple is one that's got longer um, racemes. It's a really nice one. Oops. There is another native species, Wisteria macrobotrys, macrobotrys, botrys, that is nice as well, that has longer racemes of flowers. Neither one of our native ones are as vigorous as the Asian floribunda, which is good because that's generally overly vigorous for most landscape applications. These are, are much more in line with what people are generally wanting and needing. Well, two, I was going to say one more native. This is actually two more natives. This is Lanicera sempervirens, this reddish one. Now, it's this is a really red form. It is just the species. I think it's the light, but our native honeysuckle, which is kind of an orange, definitely an orange, more of a yellow orange throat to it. And then this uh, yellow form called Aurea. This is our, our native honeysuckle. This is not the Japanese honeysuckle that can be such a weedy pest, although which is probably reminds me of my childhood more than any other plant. 
that's probably the one plant as a child that I could name was, was honeysuckle. I didn't know it was an invasive weed that I knew, but I just loved the plant. But our native Lanicera sempervirens is really a great plant. Hummingbirds love it. They love these long tubular orange red flowers. They're great for climbing over an arbor. There are some other really nice forms like Major Wheeler and Cedar Creek that are really well worth growing, whether they're growing on an arbor or when you get to these more vigorous vines like Lanicera's and Gelsemiums and, and the, the Bignonia. I don't grow those through shrubs. I grow them on structures or up through trees. They'll climb up through there and kind of cascade out of, of the, the trees, which I, I like. Some It scares some people though. Now, there are a lot of honeysuckles, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of them, but one that I just think is cool as all get out is this Lanicera reticulata, Kinsey's ghost. And the flowers are tiny, tiny little things in here. They're not very showy at all. They're kind of yellow, white. You see them a little bit perhaps in here, but not showy. But the leaves behind the flowers join together. Now they're separate leaves as you go farther back, but the ones right behind the, the leaves. And if you look here, our native honeysuckle does that too. You know, you have regular leaves right here. And then they have these, they become, as they call it, Conate, they join together and become like this little saucer, and it looks like the stem is coming right through there. Why they do that, I have no idea. I have no idea, but they do. And so the the couple of leaves, two, three, four leaves, sets of leaves behind the flowers on this Kinsey's ghost are very silver, and they become conate like this. And it looks like eucalyptus climbing up through something. And because they're not flowers, it lasts for a long, long time. I just, it's, it's so cool. Just a, a really neat little feature on that. Very cold hardy as well. I want to talk about a few different vines for foliage. I'll talk about flowers again, but I love these for foliage. So we commonly grow two different Trachylospermums. Trachylospermum asiaticum, two different species, Trachylospermum asiaticum and Trachylospermum jasminoides. Trachylospermum jasminoides will have larger leaves. They tend to want to climb more than Trachylospermum asiaticum, although the asiaticums will climb as well. But often I'll use these Asian Trachylospermum asiaticum as a ground cover. So this is one called Hatsuyuki. It's also been in the trade as tricolor and in the trade as snow in summer and maybe one or two other names. But despite what they say about some of those, like snow in summer being more restrained and not as vigorous, they are all exactly the same plan. You know, it's people like to put their own names on things, but they're all Hatsuyuki. So this is what it looks like in the spring. Later in the summer, you lose a lot of that pink, some of the white, and it becomes more white and green. But this is it as a ground cover. Now, it will climb. It will climb up through shrubs. It'll climb up a wall. It will climb. And when it climbs, you'll start to get white flowers on it. Although not, my experience, not a terribly heavy bloomer. Although I think Chris has some, some of these Trachlospermum asiaticum, some of the colorful forms that flower well for him. I, I do have this one up a tree, Mark. It doesn't What's flower that? all that much, and it looks like it loses some of the um, beautiful white and pinks to the foliage. It's a lot more green up the tree. But yeah, the new yeah and that doesn't surprise me that it loses yeah. some of that coloration once it starts flowering and becoming mature. So it's it's a good one to trim back. Now, if you get this plant, you buy it and you plant it, and you know, it's, it may in the pot, it may look this good, or it may just be more green with a little bit of white in there. You plant it and it grows that first season and it just looks green and a little bit white variegated and doesn't look very good. And you say this, eh, I don't know. And the next year it's a little better, but not much. Wait until that third year. That third year is when it really, really takes off and starts looking great. I have some growing as a ground cover at my house. And 
what I do is I get that really good spring flush. Looks great. It starts to go more white and green over the summer, and I don't want it spreading too far. And I'll just one day while I'm out mowing the grass, I'll just mow over it in, say, late June. And that keeps it from, from getting too vigorous, but also encourages a whole new set of new growth which comes out really, really bright again, looks really good in through the rest of the rest of the summer. And when I grow this through plants, I do grow this sometimes up and through other plants. I cut it once it's vigorous after that third or fourth year, I will start cutting it back to almost to the ground every year, every other year, something like that, because this can get vigorous. And since it's so dense and it's evergreen, it can really start to, to shade out and affect a plant's growth. And I don't want my fines, you know, damaging the plants they're growing through. So I do just cut it back hard. I'm not looking for flowers on this. I just, I want that foliage. So I, I, I cut it back. There are some other forms. Um, other favorite of the large leaf ones is this Ogon Nishki, which in the spring comes out with brilliant deep orange red and becomes more coral copper and then this gold and, and green later in the season. But really kind of the same as the, the Hatsuyuki. There are some little tiny leaf forms as well, which I am just smitten with. Kifu Chiramen is one that kind of grows like Ogon Nishiki, but without the green in there, it's just comes out orange and then becomes kind of gold and then chartreuse as the season progresses. There's another one called Atsuba Shiraman. I don't think I put it in. That really is like a miniature version of this. It has the green, has the gold, starts off orange. Cool little creeping plants. And there, there are several of these small leaf forms, but they can be very vigorous. They will grow fast once they get going. We regularly cut ours back. If we, you know, we keep them out of plants if we want them as ground covers where we do let them grow up structures or other plants, we do trim them back on occasion to keep them from overwhelming the other plants. Another evergreen that I love is Cadsura japonica. Um, Cadsura vine is one of several plants that's often called mag magnolia vine, not to be confused with other plants known as magnolia vines, which I'll show you, or the Katsura tree. This is Japanese Katsura vine. So this is one called Fukurin. Fukurin just means it's got a variegated margin. That's that's all that, that really implies with the plant. But this is it in the spring. You can see that fresh new growth. And then over the winter, this is what it does. It will always have these, mm. these reddish tints to it. But you can see it starts almost yellow green. Then it becomes white, as, more white as the season progresses. And then over winter, it's really a green and white with these this red coloration when it gets cold. But it's an evergreen plant and really quite beautiful. It has to get going up for a bit before it'll start flowering, but when it does, it can be really pretty. I'll show you some Cadsura flowers. Here are a couple other ones. Shiramen, which is just a, this speckled variegation. It comes out kind of coppery bronze and then does that. And then Kumagai, which is more instead of the white speckling, this is more of a creamy yellow uh, speckling as well. Love these for their, their evergreen presence as well as color kind of year round with that evergreen variegated leaves. So this is a different species, Cadsura longa pedunculata, and this is just the non-variegated. This is kind of what Cadsura japonica looks like if you have the non-variegated form. This is it growing up our old lath house. And you see, this is the flower and it's called longa pedunculata because the flowers are on these long stalk, stalks pedicels, peduncles, when it becomes fruit. And then this is the fruit on there. And you can see, when you look at the flower, you can see a real relationship to, uh, to Elysium. These are very, very primitive plants. Cadsuras and the schizandras, I'll show you, are some of the most primitive of all plants, you know, with a flowering plant, excuse me, all, most primitive of all flowering plants, along with uh, magnolias and Elysium and, and some plants like that. So 
Cadsuras have separate male and female plants. This is a male flower on there. One year, ours here fruited really well in the old laugh house before we replaced it. And sometimes, and I think that might have been after that drought of 2007. I need to go back and double check my notes on that. And I was really surprised by it, how well it fruited. And I think that 2007 hundred year drought we had kicked some evolutionary imperative into the plant and it that one year maybe formed both male and female plants. This male and female thing is not as cut and dry as we sometimes like to think it is, especially with with plants. We often talk about dioecious plants and monoecious plants as, you know, that these are, you know, like with hollies, separate male and female, you know, you got to have both. But the truth is, if you go and look at flowers in a lot of these plants long enough and um, in enough different like seed populations, like in the wild and things like that, you will find plants that have both male and female flowers. Sometimes, sometimes you'll find plants that have perfect flowers, um, both male and female parts in the same flower. And so there is some overlap with those, with those things of plants. I think I have a picture in here later, maybe with Schisandra, which has a very similar flower showing the difference in male and female flowers. So if you're growing one of these, you can go out and see what it is. Another great plant for foliage, not for flowers, but not evergreen, is this Boston ivy called Fenway Park. It was found as a sport on the big green monster, you know, the big green wall at Fenway Park by Peter Del Tradici at the Arnold Arboretum, Harvard University. He, he saw this bright gold sport and collected it. And we love it out here at the Arboretum on our McSwain building. This is it earlier in the spring, bright gold, goes chartreuse. And then in the fall, you, you can get some really lovely burgundy fall color on there. For those of you who are missing the Arboretum and those of you who are not there, our, our host every week, Chris Glenn, who welcomes everybody. This is his office right in here. You can come out uh, once we're open and look at this vine and say hello to, to Chris, knock on the window while you do it. Another Parthenocissus, so this is Parthenocissus tricuspidata, called Boston ivy, although it's from Asia, is uh, not to be confused with English ivy. This, that's a whole different family, whole different genus. That's hetera, so don't be scared just because it says ivy on there. This one, Henry's ivy or Henry's creeper, is a close cousin of our native Parthenocissus, which is Parthenocissus virginiana, the Virginia creeper. But this is an Asian one, and it has, oh, this the foliage on this is so, so luscious to me. It is these five leaflets kind of arranged in palmate or hand-like fashion. They emerge beautiful burgundy and then become green with this silver, beautiful silver mid-rim down each leaflet. They climb, just like all Parthenocissus, they climb with little suction cups. So these are not sending rootlets into your mortar or hurting your plant, your walls in any way. They're, I mean, they will make marks and paint for sure, but it's little suction cups. You can go up there and you can pull that off and you can see the little suction cups on there, little suction cup rootlets. So they just cling to the outside bit of the wall. They are not going into your house. They won't hurt anything if you let it grow up. But the new growth is beautiful. So what you can do if you, you know, if you're concerned with that sort of thing is you can cut it back once it's it's established and, and vigorous. You can cut it back over the winter and let all new spring growth come up and and grow again every year and cut it back every year. I have an area at my home now that's brick and it's wood above the brick. And so 
actually, while I was putting this together, I was realizing how much I missed growing this plant because I don't have it at my house anymore. And I'm going to plant it right where it can grow on that brick for about three feet. And I'm just never going to let it grow up onto my the painted wood part. And I'm going to just keep it growing horizontally along the brick rather than, than up the wood. I just I just love it. I mentioned schizandra. These are our first cousins to those cadsuras. This is one we think is sinensis. We collected it in China, in, I think in Xi'an, but it has these burgundy backs. It kind of seems to lose that as it gets older, but this great um, speckling on there. Really looking forward to seeing how that grows. But the schizandras can have beautiful, beautiful flowers. So this is one growing here at the Arboretum. This is from a collection we made in Taiwan. Arisenen, if you see Arisenensis on the name, that's from Mount Alishan, early when the area was being explored and was things were being named. They mostly got that name wrong and got it as Arisan uh, rather than Alishan. Same thing with Morrison. If you see Morrisonensis, usually that's from that same mountain in the English name they gave to the mountain was Mount Morrison, but now it goes by Alishan. But you can see these gorgeous little orange flowers. Now it's an evergreen vine, or mostly evergreen for us. So the flowers are a bit hidden. You can see this close up how they're tucked in around the leaves, but still gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Now this is a male, until that's a male. And I'll show you the difference in them. Here we go. So this is a male flower. This is Schisandra grandiflora. I have not grown this before, so I'm not counting this particular plant. I just wanted to show uh, this one when I had a, we had a good picture of male and female. That's a male and you can see all the stamens. Those will all have pollen on there when they're ready. That one looks like either the pollen has already been shed or has not been produced. And then this is a female flower. And so all these little dots are receptive stigmas. And then it will form uh, with the schisandras either a ball of fruit, kind of a red ball, much like the cadsura I showed, or it'll be kind of a long, narrow structure with those red fruits kind of sparsely stuck on all around it. Those are the two ways schisandras fruit. I had a bunch of different schizandras. There are some beautiful red ones. There's some, some hybrids from Bodnot uh, Gardens that are to die for, but I don't know that they're in the U.S., so I did not. Now, another vigorous vine, be careful, is Stontonia hexaphyla. This is a, I don't know if it has a great common name, but another plant with that kind of five leaflet excuse me, seven leaflet arrangement, you can see right there. There is a Stontonia pentaphylla with five leaflets. It has these gorgeous flowers. You can see these flowers. This is actually a picture from, we have a variegated one called cartwheel um, here at the Arboretum, but this is the more typical form. And if you're lucky uh, and you either have both male and female flowers on the same plant, which I see sometimes, or you have both male and female plants, you'll get these fruits. They become kind of purplish. They actually taste pretty good, but they're a real weird texture. So I like them, but it's when they're ripe, they're, they're not good unless they're really ripe. When they're really ripe, um, they're the texture of things that we tend to think of are probably overripe and maybe a little bit rotten, like, like a really, really, really one hour away from being too overripe plum kind of a texture in there with seeds in there. But but I, I think they're tasty. Now, this middle picture was taken at Daniel Stowe Botanic Garden in Charlotte. And I learned something or I saw something. And I, I know I have a picture, but I couldn't find it that a professor had taught me about vines. And I'd kind of forgotten about it until I went and saw it there. At Daniel Stowe, they had a row of columns and they have planted two vines on each column and their goal was to have them crisscross. And so they were having them circle the posts in opposite directions so that they could make this crisscross of stems. And then at the top of the arbor, which is what this picture is, it would be, you know, the mass of foliage and flowers and things like that. 
And so vines that grow by twining, that twist around other things, think of, um, you know, wisteria as something that does that. Um, if that's how they grow up, by twining, they have a direction that they will twine. Most vines, and don't know if this switches if you go in the Southern Hemisphere, but most vines grow clockwise. No, most vines grow counterclockwise. And these twining vines, they will grow counterclockwise. And if you try to make them grow clockwise, they will fight you every step of the way. And so you could see going up the ladder, up, up these posts, these pillars, they had the ones going counterclockwise, which were just circling and going up just fine. And then they had the ones going clockwise. And you can see they had them, they were, you know, pegging them and, and training them to do that. But you could see that these there would be these areas where they had let it grow and hadn't been on it on time and it had grown back to go counterclockwise. And then they had to straighten it back out and pin it again. And it would go and it would go back the other way. And they, you know, they were just fighting a losing battle because they were trying to get the plant to do something it didn't want to do naturally. So, you know, I talked about suckers and talked about twining. So, so really the way you get, the, there are several ways vines grow. You have little suckers that look like little suction cups. Like think of the little tips of little frog toes, you know, tree frog toes, those little suction cups. That's one way. You have rootlets. Think of English ivy or something like that that grows up that all along the stems, you have roots that are growing, these adventitious roots uh, or roots that grow where they're not supposed to normally out of the stem and they go into things. So those kind of roots can cause problems with houses uh, sometimes. Then you have plants that have tendrils. Think of sweet peas and things like that. And those tendrils can be little branchlets that come out. They can be modified leaves. They can be modified leaf tips. They come in different forms. And then there are plants that have more of those scandent type shrubs that will grow long shoots, often with thorns on those shoots. And those are designed to grow up into trees and grow out of them. If you're familiar with the shrub Eliagnus, which is another plant which often, sometimes escapes cultivation and, and gets out, it's a nice evergreen shrub, but it will throw out long branches. I mean, 10, 12 feet tall. And people wonder why they do that. They don't see that with many of their other, you know, shrubs that do that. And the reason is because in the wild, you don't see them growing as a nice rounded shrub. They start growing and they send out those shoots with those thorns on there and they go up and they'll encounter tree branches above them and they'll keep growing. So, with those Eliagnus, if you let them grow up through a tree, they will grow 40, 50, 60 feet up into a tree as a vine and not as that evergreen shrub. Those are some of the ways they can grow. Now, another one that grows with rootlets is the false climbing hydrangea, Schizophragma hydrangeoides. There is a true climbing hydrangea, hydrangea anomala, Hydrangea anomala can often be very shy to start flowering. It just does not seem to start flowering very early for us. So this false climbing hydrangea, schizophragma, a close relative to it, is a great substitute because it will flower as a much younger plant. This one, if you're growing it up something, once it gets to about four feet or so tall, it'll start flowering, whereas hydrangea anomala often needs to get to eight or 10 feet up a structure before it really starts flowering. But you can tell the difference between the two very easily in flower. Hydrangea anomala has these fertile flowers, the small ones, the, the lace cap, and then these infertile florets around the outside in a climbing hydrangea, there'll be four of these brats, just like we see in our typical garden hydrangeas. And schizophragmas will just have this one big sepal around there. So it's a little bit of a different texture. There are other schizophragmas though. This is the most common one, but there are other ones. This one I really like, Integrifolium it has longer, bracts are longer. And look at this, it's been grown up along this wall it will not cling to the wall very well by itself. I mean, you really need to pin it to the to a wall like this. It'll grow up a tree okay without much help, 
but on a wall, like on your house, you really need to, to do some, some work to get it up there. Some sort of pins to the wall to keep it up. Won't do it itself. The climbing hydrangea, the true climbing hydrangea will do it much easier. And even the schizophragma hydrangeoides will better than integrifolium. I usually, if I'm trying to grow it up a tree or something like that, I try and grow it up a significantly sized tree, but one that's branched fairly low. So I can kind of get it, help it get up into the branches and really get going. Now, some vines are really nice for us in that they die all the way back to the ground and we don't have to worry about pruning them or worrying about them getting out of bounds. This is our lath house. And here you can see growing up on this little structure, a tutor, as they call them in France, is this Bomeria. Bomeria is a Central and South American plant. It is first cousin to Alstromeria, the Inca lilies. The foliage looks like an Alstromeria, the flowers look like Alstromeria, and they flower in these big clusters of flowers. And you can see this, uh, these clusters. Now, not sure what species this is. It was collected by the University of California, Berkeley Botanic Garden in Mexico, uh, in, in the mountains in Mexico, but still not something we would think would be hardy. This plant has been in the ground since 2012 or 13 and has come back every year. It grows, it flowers, and then it dies back to the ground and then comes back every year. We have distributed this before. I would love to know if people have it in their garden, some of our members, if they have it in their gardens and it's still doing well for you, the only way to propagate it is by seed, maybe by layering, but you cannot take cuttings of it and have them root. Uh, it just does not work. And this will keep, what's nice, you see this is, you see with the hydrangea blooming there, this is late spring, early summer for us, and it is flowering and it will continue to flower all summer, you know, pretty much until frost. It'll keep going, putting out flowers. I am just dying to try more and more of these bomerias and see if we can find more that are good and hardy. But they're hard to come by to get seed so we can grow them out and really test them. And of course, you couldn't give a talk about vines without talking about the queen of vines, as they call it. And those are clematis or clematis or clematis or however you want to say it, you can say it. And if anybody tells you you're, they're, you're wrong, tell them to go find you somebody, uh, a native Latin speaker, because it's a dead language and nobody speaks it. So say it however you want and don't worry about it. So when people typically think of clematis, they think of these large flowered types. They have these great big flowers, the Montana types or large flower types. And those are beautiful. I always say you're in a any self-respecting neighborhood, three quarters of the, the mailboxes here in Raleigh will have uh, clematis or clematis growing up the mailbox. I got to admit, I don't love these great big flowered ones that much. And that seems sacrilegious to say, but it's true. I, I do like this one. This one's Killian Donahue. And this is it. It opens up and it is this nice deep pink. All the literature says it is ruby red when it opens up. It is no more ruby red than I don't know what. It is at best burgundy. But th as the flower ages, this central stripe, so this is newly opened right here, dark, you know, like these, it slowly becomes lighter at the edges, lighter at the edges until you wind up with a flower like this. So when it's in full bloom, you have, it's almost like you have a mixture of different plants growing through there because they just vary in color. And what I also like about Killian Donahue is it flowers heavily in the spring, but then it will rebloom lightly later in the growing season. So pruning, pruning clematis. Uh, there are three pruning groups, right? Isn't that what you, you, you always tell? And people want to make these so complex. It's not complex. Once again, if your plant flowers early in the spring, you know, just pay attention to your plants. If your plant flowers early in the spring, then you don't want to prune it hard. So what they call prune group one in clematis 
are ones that flower early in the spring. And so what they generally tell you to do is wait until the buds start swelling and where you get really nice fat buds swelling at the, the leaf bases on the stems, you can, you can prune above those leaves, prune off anything above those. Here's what I'll say to you. If you wanna prune the tips of those, knock yourself out. You don't have to, but you can. Often what you have at the tips of a clematis is it'll be dead. So you may have three, four, 10 nodes, you know, from leaf to leaf to leaf that is dead above where those buds are nice and fat and swelling in the late winter into spring. And so, you know, you'd probably, you know, pluck those off anyway, but you don't need to do anything. Group two are ones that flower later in the spring and summer. So group one, they're flowering on old wood, last year's wood. They formed the buds the previous year. So you cannot prune, if you prune it hard over the winter, you will get no flowers. Group two really are ones that flower on new, new growth on old wood. So you can prune those back a little bit to keep them in shape. Here in the Southeast, I don't think it's great advice. I think they're, you're better off with those, pruning those immediately after they flower if you want to prune them at all. Again, you don't have to. The farther north, they're really blooming in summer, you know, but for us, it's still spring usually. So I usually don't prune those. And then the last group, the group three, are ones that flower on new growth. And a group, group three, you can cut those back down to, you know, four or six inches tall and let them regrow because all the flowers are going to come on that new growth. You don't have to cut them back that hard, but you can. So let's talk about some of those. Here's a real easy one. Clematis serosa, and this is a form called freckles. Typical serosa, the interior is speckled, but much lighter. Those who grow these plants know they, they flower from about October, November through maybe March. So this picture was taken in January, I think. They flower in the middle of winter. They are small, little, delicate flowers. And I love the small flowered clematis. I'm, I'm just obstinate. I, I like big, gaudy things when nobody else does or when the majority don't. And when everybody else likes big gaudy things like big gaudy flowers on camellias and clematis, I like the smaller flower one. So this flowers during the winter. So if you want to prune it, you prune it after it finishes flowering in the spring. Easy peasy. You don't have to worry about it. But isn't that great to have flowering vines that are going during right during the middle of winter, especially something that's so delicate. That's about, you know, an inch and a half, two inches across. Just a uh, gorgeous little thing. And I love these species ones. Some of these species ones, look, this, I know there's this picture's a little bit fuzzy, but it's the best picture I had. And I wanted to show it. The, the petals on this Clematis odoforum, I mean, that thing's like, uh, you know, an uh, eighth of an inch uh, thick. These are these thick, leathery petals, small flowers. The petals will reflex a little bit more, but not too much. This is a type three. I prune this back to the ground and let it climb up into my tree every year. It does that without a problem. And the beauty, especially of these, a lot of the species types, but the other ones too, are fruit. So this is what the, the seed heads look like on a lot of the clematis. Isn't that gorgeous? They're these just these little feathery things. These are fresh ones. As they dry, they'll turn brown. And if, if they're going brown, you can pluck that off and it'll break apart into individual seed with a long hair on there, which, you know, if this is climbed up into a tree, that hair helps it kind of flutter around and move into different directions and things. So it's great. But this flowers relatively early considering I cut it all the way back. So it, it, it flowers about midsummer. And I really encourage people to look into some of these species clematis. They're so, they're just so choice. And they're, and many of them are not overly vigorous. So this climbs up into a small tray for me. 
Clematis zoprica, Princess Kate. You can see it's got this purpley back to the flowers and then pure white on the inside. A lot of my favorite ones are these little lily flower types. They have our native Clematis texensis as one of the parents. This was the first with a just a clean white eye to the flower. This flowers for me off and on from about oh June through August. And I've just got it growing through a beauty berry. Got it growing through pearl glam beauty berry. So it picks up the, the beauty berry has some of the purple in its new growth and uh, the mid ribs of its leaves. So it kind of echoes this. And then it has kind of lavender flowers, which work well with this. It doesn't, they don't, the fruit and the flowers don't overlap, but you know, this is not a large shrub and this is fine growing through it. It's, it's actually really, really kind of perfect scale. And this stops flowering and starts having its seed heads and then my beauty berry really starts showing off with its colorful fruit. So it's this, you know, take one plant and it made it multi-seasonal interest. What I need to do now is plant a clematis serosa in it so that I'll have flowers on it during winter as well and really cover all of my bases. Another one, again, this is at my house. You can see this is growing up through a an evergreen dogwood, the Empress of China or Ellsbury Cornus elliptica. So it's a, that's a very small tree. It's not real strong growing. And I have this Clematis happy Diana growing up it. And so they don't quite overlap in flower. I was really hoping they would, but, but they don't quite do that. But you can see this is it growing out through the top of my plant. It's got some big leaves on there. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And again, it flowers kind of same time as this Zaprika. Uh, so I cut this back again every year, but right now I've still got, it's still left up because it's got seed heads like this all over it. And so I have, you know, coming out of this evergreen dogwood, I have these beautiful seed heads just decorating it. So I'll cut it back soon. I need to do it real soon now that we've started warming up for us, but I, I just, you know, it's a beautiful plant. The dogwood is a beautiful plant. It'd be a beautiful evergreen all winter by itself. Great. I could do that. But, you know, this gives me that added, added seed heads during the winter, but also it gives me a whole nother season of flowering by easily a month or two on the plant. And I mean, how can you, you can't be mad at that flower, can you? And you can see how big they are. These are, you know, four to six inches or so tall probably closer to four than six. Just ooh, love that deep color. Beautiful. So there are always lots of questions with vines. So I wanted to stop early enough to make sure I could talk about those questions, although, and, and answer anything uh, you might have for me. Uh, looks like there's a lot in the chat. Hopefully, Chris, I'll answer a lot of these, but uh, we, did, we did just have a question mark that was more personal for you. Flora, yeah. Flora was wondering if you cut the beauty berry back in, in, in the end of the winter, early spring. I don't. I haven't yet. Let me let me say that. So Pearl Glam is a hybrid. It's got Calicarpa quangtungensis in it. That's one of the parents. Calicarpa quangtungensis is very, very upright, not real broad and spreading. And it's got the beautiful dark coloration to the leaves. And so it, it gives that characteristic to, to Pearl Glam. And so, so far, Pearl Glam has not seemed to want to grow out of bounds. It's been very upright, like, like one of its parents. And it hasn't grown as tall as Quang Tungensis usually does. Now, it's only been in the ground for three years. So it could, you know, I could change my opinion. That's, I haven't grown it longer than that. I did this year for the first time, I did trim it back a little bit. I took off, uh, I took it from about maybe five feet to four feet, mostly taking off the, the tops of the branches that had had fruit on there. So where there was all the little old uh, pedestals for the fruit that, st uh, that stay on the stems, I cut back below that. And then there were a couple other, stalks that were kind of sticking up oddly after I did that. I took those off. And Betty has asked, do you have any good sources for vines that you've seen? 
Yeah, sure. There are great mail order places that do vines, but there's one called Brushwood Nursery in particular that only does vines. They're in Georgia, kind of near Athens. The owner of Brushwood Nursery was a grower at Longwood Gardens and moved there, and they grow all kinds of vines. Good sources for native vines. Any of the native plant growers, Brushwood is good for native vines as well. Ian Catton at Wood Thrush Natives probably has them, nearly natives. But there are a lot of them out there. Question about chocolate vine, Akebia, how do you tame a chocolate vine? Probably best thing to do is rip it out. And then every time you see it coming back, spray it with Roundup. Uh, You know, they're, they can be tough. Uh, You know, if you want to keep it, just cut it back hard regularly is, is the best thing to do. Suggestions for clematis that will grow better than others in the Wilmington area. So those last those those last couple I showed with the lily flowers, the lily flower types. Like I said, those almost always have clematis texensis in the parentage, and texensis is a good heat tolerant clematis. So my experience so far with those are they are they are proving to be quite heat tolerant, which some other clematis, they, you know, they want shaded roots and lots of sun for the tops. The other nice thing about those lily flower types with Texas, Texensis in the parentage is clematis Texensis is not a large vine. So these are plants that stay really pretty compact. Most of them are in the six to eight or 10 foot range is, is really as big as uh, those as I've, I've seen. Val has commented that she's purchased a clematis and that it's growing already. She's wondering if she should wait until the last frost to plant them. Um, I, I would plant it. Clematis are, are really quite cold hardy. Well, are you, who was that? Was it somebody here local or? Yes. Yeah, it was Val. She oh, lives yeah, I, I would go ahead and, and plant that without a problem. Worst that'll happen is it'll, it, you know, if we get a real cold spell, it could nip the, the tip out of it, but it'll it'll come back. It won't kill it. And Carolyn's wondering if you have any good suggestions for a vine to grow in an, an Andina. Any vine, uh, you know, a small vine. You don't want a great big vine. Those those little clematis would be great. Some of the smaller uh, leafed trackless spermums you could, although you'd have to you'd have to chop one on them a a little bit. But yeah, I mean, really all you're looking for is a vine that's, you know, not going to get too big. Uh, You know, Nandina just doesn't have the size to take a a really large vine. Some of those species clematis, there are a lot out there that are great. The Bomeria would be a really good one. Those colors would work with the foliage colors of, of Nandina. Marianne is wondering if any of the clematis that you showed or any, anyone any, any other one would be a good cut flower. I've never thought about using them as a cut flower. I know some of them are more stemmy than viney. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you have really long stems on them. I think that would be a problem. I know, and I don't know how long they last. I know, oh, yeah. I will say Happy Diana. I have picked a flower off that to show my wife and it, like laid it on a counter and it was good, you know, it still looked good 24 hours later, just not in water, not in anything. So that one might work, but I, you know, that's cut flowers are not my thing. Shade tolerant vines. So the, the Parthenocissus, both Parthenocissus are shade tolerant. The Cadsura is very, very shade tolerant. A lot of the vines that you grow, the Trechlospermum are shade tolerant. You know, a lot of vines are, they naturally grow up trees. So by definition, they are growing in shadier environments. Uh, So a lot of them do. And I grow, I grow, and there's other like Stontonias and Schisandras, the climbing hydrangeas. I grow all of those in the shade. My goal is to have a, at least one vine on every tree that I have and every 
plant that I have. In fact, I have a pineapple guava, which is a very evergreen, for those who don't know, it's evergreen plant with really nice silvery blue uh, leaves on it. I have a small species yellow flowering clematis that I grow on there. And I just recently planted a Bauhinia vine, Bauhinia unanensis, which has little pink flowers to grow up through that as well. Rachel would like to hear your opinion on passiflora. She's probably used to Tim talking about how much he enjoys them. Tim loves passiflora and they were in my talk and then I took them out. So mm -hmm. passiflora, that is passion vine, gorgeous flowers, drop dead gorgeous flowers. We have native passiflora, passiflora incarnata is native. I don't grow them personally. They seed around in my garden. They sucker around in my garden. So my personal opinion is they are beautiful and Tim loves them. If he wants to wrangle them here at the Arboretum, okay. I think they're a bigger pain than they're worth. Although when you show somebody the flower who has never seen one of those flowers before, it's kind of worth it for them. If I were gonna plant one, I would plant one in my woodland and I would plant our native Passiflora incarnata, or I would plant a tropical one and take cuttings of it every year and bring it inside because there's some really nice tropical ones. Now, last and one's a good one. Rachel, Rachel, whose question that was, is a former intern here at the Arboretum. And you know, I teased March 24th all day something. Rachel's gonna join us for that for a little bit. So you'll have to come in and then you can, you can see and hear Rachel as well. Yep. Uh, Chris has suggested we form a Raleigh Ivy League to save the oaks from the ivies growing up them. I did, I did see some recently that were uh, quite full of ivies. Yes, and, and ivy only hurts plants when they actually shade them out or when they become so thick and dense and heavy that they become wind catchers and you have a big storm and limbs break out and things like that. They don't, they're not parasitic or anything like that. Vine on Harry Louder walking stick, uh, anything, preferably something really, really vigorous like bignonia or just simium that'll completely cover it so you don't have to look at the ugly thing. I'm, I'm joking. I'm, I'm editorializing. It's not my favorite plant. But what I would do with, that, with Harry Louder walking stick, honestly, is I would get a clematis that is a group three clematis or some other vine that dies to the ground, like that Bomeria I showed, because during the winter, you wouldn't want the structure of Harry Lauder walking stick obscured at all by, by a vine's branches growing through there. So I'd want something that dies completely or that I can cut to the ground completely. So nothing is impeding the, the winter view of the, the, the walking stick. And then in summer, when it doesn't look as great to me, that's, you know, personal opinion, then you have something that's growing and flowering and adding some more character to it. Catherine was wondering if the uh, honeysuckles are easy to propagate. Yeah, I'd honeysuckles say. are easy to propagate, very easy. Many, many vines are. Yeah. Suggestions for a vine for pot to give privacy, full sun and horrible conditions for a restaurant. So your, your, your main thing is you're going to want to, you know, keep it watered, but vines like lots of sun. So you want a big enough pot to, to get it going and uh, really go and lots of water for, for that. That may be a good area for a chocolate vine because they're very vigorous. And they grow quickly. What I would do is maybe plant a couple of vines in a pot. And I didn't mention this when I talked, but often it's nice to plant two vines together that flower either at the same time with complementary flowers or at different times so that you extend the season. So, you know, roses and clematis are a, climbing roses and clematis are a, you know, kind of like peas and carrots. They, they've, they've been a match for a long time. You just want to make sure you don't pair a really vigorous, vigorous vine with one that's not very vigorous been planted at the same time. 
So if I want to do that, I will plant the less vigorous vine first and give it a year or two to establish and then come in with the more vigorous vine. But, you know, Trachylospermum is tough. I would actually, probably what I would say is not the Trachylospermum I showed, but go for Trachylospermum jasminoides, which is a, a really good climber, very fragrant flowers. I don't know. Sometimes if, if you're a super high end restaurant, you may not want really fragrant flowers because, you know, fragrances can, can get in the way of taste, but yeah, I would, I would think that another great one is that I didn't show there's a evergreen, well, there's many evergreen clematis, but clematis armandii, which is a, an evergreen clematis, really quick grower, flowers really early, late winter, early spring. The only downside to it is whenever I grow it, I get aphids on it and have issues with that. But that's, that's what I would do. What vines produce edible fruits like kiwis? Kiwi, I didn't, I, I couldn't, didn't have time for that. Great plant. You need male and female. Make sure you get male and female. And they're super hardy. The passion vine we talked about, may pops are the fruit on there. You can get edible passion vine. You know, grapes, of course, are great edible fruits you can get on vines. I know I'm missing some things, some obvious things. You help me? I, I was thinking of the uh, one that's for beer, which I'm drawing a blank at hops. right now. Hops, hops. yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't go out and, and graze on them, but that is used. Yeah. Not, yep. not, not too many vines. Well, tomato, I guess, is a vine, isn't it? Uh, to, yes. Uh, yes. Vine there are actually a lot of annual vines. You know, you can grow uh, cucurbits like yep. pumpkins and, and cucumber and cucumbers and watermelons is a vine. You just things with big fruit, you, you have to give them some support, you know, gourds and things like that. Yeah. A so, jasmine, as somebody asked about jasmine, jasmine, there are some great jasmines out there. Not all are hardy. So make sure you get a hardy one, but there, there are some great ones with white and yellow and pink flowers, different species. Diane you, asked if you mentioned Dutchman's pipe, which I know you didn't, but got any general comments on that one? Dutchman's pipe is great. I didn't mention it. Again, just time. We have native Dutchman's pipe. There are some really tropical ones that are crazy looking. There are others that are fantastic. All of them, as far as I know, are great food sources for the larvae of pipevine swallowtails, not just our native ones. So I think you can grow a lot of those. Rabbits love Confederate jasmine, uh, the trackless vermin. Hmm, I didn't know that. So hardy kiwis, yes, kiwis are very, very hardy, and many of them are beautiful. They have like white and pink variegated foliage on there. They can be, they can be gorgeous, and they are very hardy, many of them. And the really good fruiting ones, we're going to have some great information from Texas, SFA Gardens, Stephen F. Austin Gardens, they are doing a lot of research on kiwi. And guess what? They just had, you know, negative nine degrees Fahrenheit temperature. So they're going to have lots of interesting data about that. Oh. That's it for the questions in the comments. Great. Uh, Dirk did mention the uh, Gourd Society's URL, which was great. That's a, a wonderful society. When the state fair happens, they always have a wonderful exhibit over there in October. Yeah. Yes. <sighs> Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's another really fun uh, event. I hope to see you all in person very, very soon. And mark your calendars for March 24th. It's going to be a big time here. So uh, mark, mark, mark that. And we'll, more information will be coming your way. Thanks a lot, Mark, for a great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for coming by. Thank you, Chris. And Plant Buggy is out tomorrow at 8 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays, now that it's March. Thank you, Mark and Chris. Thanks, Sally. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, too. I missed you guys. <laughs> Me, too. I didn't realize how much I'd miss chatting with everybody every week. <laughs>
And I hope we'll see everyone tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. Yes, yes. That's going to be a great talk.